is Claire from the Atlanta County Library in Hamilton. I'm Mary Beth from the Brigantine Library. And welcome to What's Your Family History? An Introduction to Genealogy. What is genealogy? It's the study and tracing of lines of descent or development, or in other words, just family history. The first thing I'm going to talk about is privacy. A lot of people are concerned understandably about putting their privacy, private things out there. So what you have to remember is, is that not everybody's going to want to cooperate with you. You also want to make sure that if you're doing this on an, uh, an online site such as Ancestry or Heritage Quest, that you want to make sure that the site that you use blocks living people's information. What it'll do, in, say for the case of my grandparents, it would have my grandparents listed. And then you would see the information on all of my aunts, uncles, my mother, but you won't see the information on her youngest sister who's still living. And this is important because doing it where everything's out there, it can be stolen and you can become a victim of identity theft. It's especially a point of important with children, especially those that aren't adults yet, because their information can be stolen just as easily as any adults. Okay. And because of that, we're going to talk about vital records. In New Jersey and Pennsylvania, vital records are not public information. That means that you have to be related, either a parent or a grandchild or a child, to get the information. In New Jersey specifically, it's... 40 years for deaths, 50 for marriages, and 70 for births. And the reason those numbers are so large is they figure that the average lifespan is 70 years when they created this rule. Also, in New Jersey, records are held at both the state and local level, depending on issue. So say you want to find your father's birth certificate. You know that he was born in Atlantic City in, say, 1940. So you would start off with the Vital Records Office in Atlantic City. And if they didn't have it, they would send you to the county clerk. And if the county clerk might then send you to the state archives, because after a certain period of time, the county is, respon is responsible for sending that information on to the state. And that's usually after about 50 years or so. Okay, the New Jersey Vital Records website can be found at the URL posted on the slide and they have th three major types. They have certified records which contain a erased seal and you would use that for where you're trying to prove something with regards to a will or a marriage or you need to prove that somebody really did exist it. Ge they have a genealogy record which does not contain the race seal and is not considered certified. They're just for your own personal use in building your family tree. And then there's a no record of marriage statement. And that is required by some foreign countries. So for example, if you're getting married and you want to get married in Aruba, nice place to have a wedding, the, the government of Aruba is going to require a no record of marriage statement to make sure that you are not committing bigamy. Okay. And the website for the New Jersey State Archives can be found at the attached link. And it brings up a variety of databases that you can search. They are marriage, death, name changes, the Civil War and First and World War I casualties. So we're going to start off with marriage records. And if you find what you're looking for in these records, you can get a copy of them from the state for fee. Okay, so the first person we're going to look for is Richard Summers. Okay, so Richard Summers is in here. Is he in? He's in there twice, right? There's one for Kate Mayne. Yeah, Gloucester. there's one for Cape May and one for Gloucester. Now, the interesting thing about Atlantic County, which is where Richard Summers lived, is prior to, I want to say 1830, Atlantic County was part of Gloucester County, and they were split off and became Atlantic County. So at the time of Richard's, death, uh, Richard's marriage, he was 
living in Summers, what's now Summers Point, but it was still Gloucester County. Okay, so there's two records here. One is for Cape May because they had to, his wife was from Cape May County, so they had to mar file a bond with Cape May County. And then Atlanta County, or Gloucester County, um, they also fired and filed another bond. And her name is spelled differently. Yes, her name is spelled differently. That's another thing I, was, I wanted to use as an example. In the, 19th, in the 18th and 19th century, spelling was fluid, meaning that you will get all different types of spellings for the same names. So sometimes it helps just to accidentally spell it wrong, because then you'll find them. Okay. So the next one we're going to look at is death records. Okay, and the man we're searching for is George Berth, B-E-R-T-H. Okay, and there's George. Now, George Berth was a, um, a relative of my mother-in-law's. I think he was her great-grandfather. But this shows... Click on that number. That tell us. I actually have a copy of this record at home because he... She wanted to see it. Page down the bottom. So if you notice here, what we did is we put it in the shopping cart. And the fee for this one is $10. Perfectly reasonable. Okay. So the next one we're going to look at is name changes. I can never pronounce this man's last name. He's my gra mother-in-law's grandfather. All right. His first name is Frank. So a little history on Frank. Frank was born in New York State, so he was a U.S. citizen. He worked in the um, repair yards for the Pennsylvania Railroad. And what happened, the reason why he changed his last name to Hicks is because during the First World War, he was heavily harassed at work because he had a German last name. They never took into consideration that he was a U.S. citizen. So that's the story in the family. Now on his actual um, name change paperwork, all it says is he presented good and sound reasons for changing his name. So the judge didn't put in there exactly what it was. But he changed his name, changed the whole family's name, and never had a problem again. So the next one we're going to look at is the Civil War. And the person we're going to look for is another Summers. And his name is Lewis, which is L-E-W. And there he is. And again, you could buy this record if you wanted to for a very small fee. All right. Now... Can you actually set the record? Okay, so here is a list of the New Jersey Volunteers from the 23rd Regiment, which were infantries, and this is the unit that Lewis Summers was in. So by looking at this record, this page, you could then see everybody else. So if there's a rumor in your family that somebody served with one of the Summers in the Civil War, this would be a way to, to check it out. Last but not least, okay. we're doing World War I casualties. Now, this gentleman is William Parker. Now the nice thing about the World War I casualties database is it has photographs of the individuals if there was a photograph available. And there's also, they've added over time, people, other information that people have sent. So here we have a picture of William Parker 
we have all his pertinent information, his address, so on and so forth. He didn't. He technically is a World War One casualty, but he wasn't injured. He died of the flu. And at the bottom, there's a card that shows you that they sent the information to his last known next of kin, who was an aunt. And then there's a letter, I believe, from the aunt to the New Jersey War History Bureau thanking them for getting in touch with her and asking her for information about him. Okay. So in other states, since we're going to continue about vital records, they all have different rules. Texas in particular is a very open place. Um, I have a great niece who is 13 years old, and I can find her birth record online as a result of it being born in Texas. Okay. So the next thing we're going to talk about is Ancestry.com. There are two kinds. There's two versions, rather. One is the library edition, and then one is the personal subscription edition. The one here at the library is the library edition, obviously. And it isn't as... It doesn't offer you as many search options as the, the home version does. But the home version can cost you up to $500 a year, depending on how much access you want. Because I'm searching relatives who lived in Europe, I have to have a higher rate subscription than, say, if I was only doing the ones that were here in the United States. I just want to mention the U.S. Census is done every 10 years. Uh, questions, and that's since 1790. Questions on the census vary from, year, from census to census. The early census was very basic. Basically, it asked the head of the household his name, what his occupation was, and how many other people lived with him. They didn't put names in. Sometimes all they said was like six females and four males. And sometimes they would have age groups that they had to check. Um, there are special census supplements done periodically. These included the slave schedules while, when slavery was legal and the Civil War pension schedules. The 1890 census was destroyed in a fire. The only thing that really survived from that were bits and pieces here and there and, oddly enough, the Civil War pension schedule. So sometimes if you have somebody that served in the Civil War and you know that, you can find them in the, in the 1890 schedule for the Civil War pensions. You always want to start searching in the most recent census available. This is currently the 1940 census. The U.S. Census Bureau issues identifying information, meaning the, fully, the full schedule, the full census, every 12 years. So the next one will come out, it will be the 1950 census, and it will be, I'm really bad at math, it's coming up quick, let's just put it that way. <laughs> so 72 years after the census was performed, the information is released to the public. 2024, I actually have it written down, is when the 1950 census becomes available. A lot of states also took their own censuses, New York, New Jersey. They did it every 10 years, but not the same year the U.S. census was done. So in, in New Jersey, the census was done in 1875, 1885, 1895, and so on. And they stopped shortly after the turn of the 20th century. Some of them have very unusual questions. Uh, there's one, the 1910 census, wants to know how many children a woman gave birth to and how many are alive, which can be helpful for finding out if you're missing a sibling to one of your grandparents. Um, so we're going to start searching by searching the 1940 census, and we're going to look for my grandfather who thankfully used his middle initial his entire life because he has a very common name. <laughs> And his name is Joseph S. His middle initial you need to use. And his last name is Gorman. G O R M A N. Okay. And if you know where he was born, he was born in Philadelphia. Also, if they if you know don't know where they were born but know where they lived, 
or died, you can put that information in and sometimes that helps. Now if you look at what Mary Beth just did, the location says Philadelphia, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That's because the city of Philadelphia has the honor of being an entire county. So that's what the double Philadelphia means. Okay. So we're looking for him. He was I need my glasses. S, Mary yeah, that's him. Yeah. That we're looking for Joseph S and Mary V. My grandmother also always used her middle initial, thankfully. And it brings up this first sheet, which is basically all the indexed information that they got from the census itself. And this, I highly recommend you print off or save in some manner. You'll see why when you take a look at the actual census. Okay, so my grandfather was... 42. He was 42 years old, and he was born... Um, first place, Pennsylvania. Yeah, he was 18... So he's a superintendent? Yeah, he's a superintendent of a building's work. He worked for a concrete company. And if you page down a little bit, it will show you everybody that lived in the household with him. So you have Mary V. This is also an excellent example. The, what does that say, prefect? Yeah. Uh, Pernit. Pernit Gorman. Somebody couldn't read the handwriting. Um, yeah, Claw is actually my Aunt Claire, and Pernit is actually my Uncle Francis. Um, so they will also give you their approximate age and whether they're the son, daughter. Sometimes you'll find in-laws living with people, you'll find boarders, you'll find cousins, so on and so forth. But if you page back up, and we'll go take a look at the actual census thing, which you can find by clicking on the page to the left. Now these were filled out in the field, so the handwriting can be pretty atrocious Here's sometimes. The little plus sign to get it bigger. Yes, and then down the extreme left-hand column, there's a column with numbers, and then there's a blank space with writing in it sideways. That sideways writing is the street that they're on, so you can rule out whether or not it's them. They're currently highlighted in green, with my grandfather highlighted in yellow because he's the person we searched for. And across it, it will ask them things like their age, their uh, gender, whether or not they're in school, and what they do for a living. And I'm not sure if the 1941 asks if they ask if they own their own home or not, but that's on a couple of them. And it also will ask them place of birth. Now, the interesting thing about place of birth is, is that it will tell you if they're born in this country or born out of this country. And I had a relative who was born in Ireland, and everybody figured he was from Southern Ireland. He wasn't. He was from Northern Ireland. That showed up the census after he died when his son, because Ireland had gotten its freedom from England at that point, said Northern Ireland and not Irish Free State, which is often what they used in the 30s to designate Free Ireland. And we're going to look for him again in the 1910 census. I'm going down here to the bottom because I know there's all the census records are right here. So, but you can also use the big block up at the front there. 1910. Same name. Oh, Joseph. Joseph Escorman. That's not taken. So while Mary Beth's doing that, I'm going to bring up a problem that occurs in a lot of Irish families. An older sibling dies. Mom has a new baby. Mom names a new baby after the elder sibling who died. This is the case with my grandfather. His oldest brother was six years old when he died of diphtheria. Four months after he died, my grandfather was born, and so his mother named him Joseph also. The difference was she gave them different middle names. On my father's side of the family, they got identical names, middle and first names, matched totally. And the only way you can tell them apart is by their birth years. Okay. So, All right, so his parents were um, Catherine and Henry. Or you can just pick one on in random. This is just to show the difference in the um, census. Hmm. Right, Anna, 
sorry, Anna and Henry. Here's Trump. Yeah. Just before. Here's Annie. Okay. But like I said, Joseph Gorman's a very common name. Okay, so this is another one. This isn't him because this man is only two years old. Yeah. And it's the usual stuff, the information that they gleaned off of the census sheet. Children are asked, isn't it? Yeah, so if we could enlarge this right here. Mm -hmm. This is one of the ones that asks an odd question. They want to know how many children she had and how many are still living, and that's this column here. So this woman had three children and three survived. Above her, the lady had nine children and she had only six living. So it's kind of sad, this one, but it helps. It can help a great deal if you're looking for missing siblings. Okay. And now we're going to look, take a look at the 1880 census so you can see the difference between that. And we're looking up a different grandfather in this one. Also, luckily, he used his middle name his entire life. Thomas J. Hughes. He actually put lived in Philadelphia. The one I'm we're looking for was born in Ireland. Okay. I need to search them all the way down here <laughs> at the bottom. And this is just, we're doing this third one just to show you the difference between them. So just our pick Margaret. Okay. That might be him. His wife's name is Margaret. Okay, so it's the same thing. The opening screen shows you everything that they, that they indexed. And then if you look at the original, you see it's much smaller. They don't ask as many questions. This one they do have relatives next to. They have, you know, your relationship to the head of household, wife, daughter, son, mother-in-law, father-in-law. And it also shows you what everybody in the household does for a living. So he was a laborer. And then his wife was keeping house. The son worked in, and actually this is my great-grandfather. Actually, his one son worked as a clerk in the Pennsylvania Railroad. Another daughter worked in a cotton factory. And his two youngest, Kate and Charles, were at school. Unfortunately, my great-great-grandmother didn't long, live long enough for me to find out there's a huge gap in this family. The eldest son is 21 years older than the youngest son, and there's a gap of 10 years between the, the oldest and the second one. So we've always thought there's somebody in there, but we just can't find it. But the, both parents were born in Ireland. All the kids were born here in the United States. Okay. And last but not least, we're going to look at the, 19, at the 1840 U.S. Census. And this man is a local person to his his name's common semi common in this area, or at least it used to be. Now it brings up the the information page again and you'll notice it doesn't specify what their names are. It just says how old they are and whether they're male or female. And the original page is just a bunch of check marks. Names of people on that they talk to, and then the check marks for their household members. This, in the early ones, it's really important to um, print off that lovely indexed page because it's a lot easier than trying to read this on the screen. Military. 
Another thing that Ancestry allows you to examine is military records. It includes death and burial information up to the Korean War, um, draft cards for everyone who filled one out for the First World War. Now, the Second World War draft cards, originally the only ones available were for what they called the old man's draft. This was men over the age of 35 who were physically able to be in the Army, but were considered too old. At one point during the Second World War, it looked like we were going to need a lot more men in the Army. So the U.S. government issued a call for the old man's draft. And the purpose of it was going to be they were going to get all these men aged 35 to 60 to register for the draft. And then if they needed them, they were going to draft them and then put them into positions here in the United States, thereby freeing up younger men to go and fight. Thankfully, they didn't need to do it. And then military records also include information on the Civil War, Revolution, as well as peacetime service. Okay, so for more detailed information, say you want a person's whole service record, if possible, you need to contact the Veterans Administration. And they will, I believe there's a fee, but they will send you what they can. So we're going to look for a man named Hewitt Lee. Mr. Lee, the information on Mr. Lee is the result of an actual reference question that we here at Atlanta County Library had to answer. Yeah. So Mr. Lee was born in Maryland. Um, we know as a result of talking to the person asking for the information that he was an only child. He died overseas, and he was buried in a cemetery in Margraten, the Netherlands. It's the only Second World War cemetery in the Netherlands. And the really nice, I have, to, I have to say this, because the people of that town, twice a year, they've all adopted specific graves, and they go out and they clean the graves up twice a year and put flowers in the springtime. So these men are never forgotten. So this tells you where he's buried. This is the headstone and interment record for him. And it tells you where he's buried in the, in the Netherlands, in the American cemetery. And what, what he was, he was in the army and different, th and he lived in Maryland. And if you go back, we should be able to see his enlistment record. We can't locate his enlistment record right now, but it would have things on it like his next of kin, where he lived, where he was signing up, what he did for a profession. Okay. All right. So you'll see that he was born in Montgomery, Maryland. He had four years of high school, I believe, and he was considered a semi-skilled chauffeur bus trolley truck driver and his age. He was also a very slight man. He was not much taller than 5'7". And at this point, they have not assigned him to a branch. And he was he enlisted on May 10th of 1943. Now we're going to look for somebody in World War I. Okay. okay, John J. Warners. The next person we're going to look for is a John J. Gorman in World War I. And just pick anyone because... One more draft. So the very first one is fine. Okay. 
Okay, so this man lived in Newark, in New Jersey, and we're going to take a look at his draft card, because the draft cards differ from war to war. So on the left-hand side of the page, you have his information. You have his name, his address, his age, his date of birth, what um, ethnic group he belongs to, who his next of kin is, who he works for. And then on the right-hand side, you have height, complexion, if there's any scars, um, missing a finger, missing an arm, that type of thing. Now, the interesting thing is they don't want to know exact height. They don't want to know exact you know, complexion. They ask if you're tall, short, or medium in height, and dark, fair, and what's the middle one? Um, medium build. Medium build. Yeah. So they didn't really want a whole lot of information. So the next one we're going to look at We're looking for the man who built my, the father of the man who built my house. And his name is Samuel Ronchetti. And this is going to be an example of the old man's draft. And again, it's got the usual sub summary page. Now, this is the old man's draft card. It will show you his name, his age. This is actually the man who lived in my house. Um, the telephone number, his age, he's 25, he was born in Vineland. So this is actually the young man's draft card, not the old man's. And the person who is his next of kin, which is Mr. Samuel Ronchetti Sr., who's his father. And what his address Again, what the address of the person to, to connect is. Who he worked for. He worked for the Cumberland County Road Department. And they wanted to know the place of employment, and he put Courthouse Bridgeton. Okay. Now, the old man's draft is very similar. It's almost identical in, in appearance, and it will tell you who they worked for. Okay. Um, now we're going to take a look at birth, death, and marriages. Oops, sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we're going to take a look. There's a, lot of in, there's a lot of indexes under this. And we're going to take a look at the most frequently used one, at least in my opinion, which is the Social Security Death Index. So you're just going to do death. You're just going to fill in the death part, not the... Okay. And we're going to search for my mother. And her name was Mary L. Hughes. Now this includes, this index includes the deceased from the beginning of Social Security in the 1930s. The records prior to 1960 are not complete, though, because at one point the Social Security Department was having a computer malfunction where every time they updated the death index, they lost like 5,000 records from before that. It is not necessary to know the Social Security number of the person you're looking for. So we're going to look for my mother. She died in Cape May Courthouse. Okay, so this one tells you, doesn't give you a whole lot of information, tells you the date of death, and it provides you with this. So I'm going to steal the computer from Mary Beth for a minute. Sure. And we're going to go back and find the one that shows you what I need to find you. Uh, I'm going to edit. I'm going to put in the 
she was born in 1929. And I'm going to go down here to death. And there she is. That's the, the New Jersey death index, just gives you that. Social Security. There's a lot of different death indexes. Um, so now we're just going to pick one of these. Okay. No, doesn't show you. But see, it gives you a little bit more information. It doesn't show you the original record, but it will give you the Social Security number. It will tell you the date of birth, the date of death, the, the year that it was issued. Now, if your Social Security card was issued before 1951, that's all it'll say. It won't say, you know, 1939, 1940. It will only say before 51. It will give you the issuing state. In this case, it was Kansas. The last known residence, which was El Paso, Colorado. The day, the last benefit was sent to, and the date of death. So sometimes, my mother didn't live in Cape May Courthouse, but she died there. So hers, her last benefit and her death benefit will be going to two different places. The other two, which I'm just going to talk about, the other one I'm going to talk about, which is kind of interesting, is called Find a Grave. It's done entirely by volunteers, and what they do is they go out and they photograph headstones in cemeteries and then post them up there. The reason I'm mentioning it is because these people are very giving. You can actually request them to go take a picture of a tombstone. And when they have time, they will go and do it, and they will let you know that they sent it. I asked, uh, find a search to find the headstone of my father's aunt because we couldn't figure out when she died. It took them four years, but they finally found her because she was in this huge cemetery, and her last name was very, very common. Okay, so now... And at findagrave.com, membership is free if you want to join. You do have to join to ask for a photo. And if you just want to spend some time in the fresh air photographing cemeteries, they're more than willing to tell you how to do it. So what we're going to talk about now is obituaries. Now... Obituaries are kind of a sticky point. Not everybody will have one. Not everybody will have one for different reasons. I knew of a lady who didn't want an obituary because she didn't want her age in it. I knew another person who couldn't afford one. And so on and so forth. Because there was a period of time where they were expensive. Then they were free for a while. And now they're back to getting up into the expensive range again. That's why sometimes all you see is the minimal information. But if you luck out and you can find one, you can find out sometimes where the person lived when they died, how many children they had, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, what they may or may not have done for a living, any organizations you belong, they belong to. My mother's great-grandfather was Protestant. Everybody else in the family is Catholic. Nobody realized he was Protestant until they saw his obituary because he belonged to the Masons. And at that time, Catholics were not allowed to belong to the Masons. <laughs> okay. All right, so now we're going to talk about immigration and naturalization. The major ports of immigration prior to the opening of Ellis Island in 1895, which is in New York City, and Angel Island, which is in San Francisco and opened in 1910, were Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Norfolk, Savannah, Charleston, New Orleans, Seattle, and Chicago. Now, there's an interesting thing I want to point about Philadelphia. The majority of Philadelphia and New York, the majority of people who entered through the Port of New York tended to stay in the North Jersey and New York City area. The people who ended up in Philadelphia tended to head west which is just a very odd thing, because it often took two weeks longer to get to Philadelphia than it did New York City, because they had to wait for the tides. Early immigrations very great, early immigration records vary greatly depending on the port of entry, and until the mid-1800s, there were no standard requirements. 
The various passenger records include passenger lists, crew lists, and border crossing lists. So we're going to search ellisisland.org, which has the records for the people who came into. And we're going to look for one of my least favorite persons. This is another reference question that we had a few years ago. The reference question we had was a lady had purchased a pair of pistols at an auction that were made by a gunsmith with the last name of Mitnock. And she wanted to know about him because he lived in Egg Harbor City. We're actually searching for his wife. And the reason is, is she doesn't change her first name like he does. Okay, they didn't find it. But anyway, Mr. Mitnock and his family, Frederica and his two daughters, came to the United States from Germany. He, I don't know what he had about his name, but he kept changing it. He, came, he entered the country as Theodore Mitnock. Then they lived in Pennsylvania, I mean, in New York for a while. Then they moved to Philadelphia, where he changed his name to Edward Midnight. Then he changed his name when they moved to Egg Harbor City and became Edmund Mitnock. Now, a few interesting informations, the information about Mr. Mitnock is that he actually served in the Civil War at the age of 60. Because he was a gunsmith, he didn't actually fight, he just fixed them. And the other interesting thing I find interesting is this man had the misfortune of outliving every member of his family. He didn't die till the 20th century, and the only person left alive that he was related to was his grandchild, who was married.